So I think there are a number of things that can be done. Obviously, at an individual level, one can make that decision to, for example, uh, to exercise more or to take more active travel, walking and cycling. But at the same time, it's difficult to do that if you don't have a safe environment in which to walk and cycle. So it seems to me that whilst I'm in favour of, you know, one-to-one -one interventions. Indeed, as a GP myself for 20 years, I spent a lot of time talking to people about lifestyle and so on. At the same time, you need to actually create the policy environment where it makes it easier for people to change their lifestyle. So there's no point in me or anyone else telling people that they should be exercising more if it actually is rather difficult to do that. And I think the whole thrust of a lot of policy has been to put that in the hands of the individual, to do things like um, you know, attending fitness classes or gyms or whatever. I think the evidence that we have is that that's actually quite difficult to sustain behaviour change on that very individualistic way. And that actually you need to have uh, local policies um, which make it make facilitate people living a healthy lifestyle. So it seems to me it's the combination, by all means, of informing individuals, but at the same time, perhaps the link between public health and local government could form an, a kind of avenue, a way in which one can change some of the local policies which will enable people to have a more healthy lifestyle but also ultimately a lower carbon one. I'm rather sceptical that everything can be achieved just through purely voluntary agreements and I think one of the problems as I mentioned uh, earlier was that actually at the moment uh, we're not uh, paying the full cost of the kind of strategies by which we live, I mean the kind of energy use that we the energy use strategies that we, uh, we live by today are not actually taking into account the kind of full economic cost of, of the carbon that we're emitting. So it seems to me while, uh, unless you can actually change the system to recognise some of the externalities of the kind of high fossil fuel economy that we have, then it's going to be very difficult uh, to change policy. So it seems to me that you need to address these fundamental policy levers, uh, first of all, before you can really expect uh, the private sector to deliver on some of these targets. Um, I do think it's a matter though of making the arguments uh, clear, in other words demonstrating that um, in fact there will be tangible benefits to many of these policies. The government has indicated that it does want to tackle non-communicable diseases, for example. It's very difficult to see how you can tackle non-communicable diseases without making it easier for people to move around actively without making it possible for people, for example, to cycle more easily and more safely, uh, and, and also without um, reducing people's consumption of unsustainable saturated fats from animal products and so on. So uh, yes, I think it is a very uh, serious um, uh, and difficult challenge, but um, we have seen very radical changes already. I mean, who would have predicted, at least I wouldn't have predicted, uh, that in we would have moved so rapidly with tobacco policy, for example. So, for example, a, a few years ago, I think many of us would have been very sceptical that we could win over people to the argument that there would be no smoking in pubs, for example, um, in public places. And yet, once that decision was made, once the arguments were marshalled, then decision makers did uh, fall into line. And there were major policy shifts enacted, which, as I say, many of us might have predicted would not have happened. So. I think while it's difficult, I think it is possible uh, when you marshal all the scientific evidence to make changes in policy.